The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. We've got Tony coming up at 11 o'clock, and he actually may talk about this because uh, I've known him over 30 years, and uh, there's only one team that I've known him to be a fan of. Uh, I guess it, as a kid, he was a fan of the Mets and the Jets, but as a sports writer here in Washington, yeah, he wrote about the Redskins. He did a series of columns called the Bandwagon Columns where he essentially made fun of how good they were. Uh, he used to say how much he loved the Boulet, <laughs> the Bullets, who weren't very good. He was sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek with that. But he was fully on board as a Nats fan and remains a Nats fan. Good, good for him for remaining loyal while they stink. But it was four years ago tonight that the Nationals won the World Series with Max Scherzer on the mound. Ironically, Max Scherzer is back on the mound in the World Series tonight in Game 3 at Arizona pitching for the Texas Rangers. Uh, who'd, have, who'd have thought four years ago that that would be the case, but that is the case. And four years ago, he was on the mound trying to close out the World Series for the Nationals, which was even more remarkable given the journey that they had come from to get there, going from 19-31 and 31, going into Memorial Day weekend to getting into the wild card to being down against the Brewers and the unhittable Josh Hader, Juan Soto delivering the game-winning hit and then ultimately advancing to the World Series where they played the Houston Astros and for the first time in the history of North American sports won the championship, winning all four of their games on the road. And it was incredible how it all unfolded, particularly in this series. Now, it opens in Houston. The Nationals win the first two games. Well, the assumption is going home for the next three, they got a chance to to close this out. You know, maybe it's going to be a sweep, but even if you lose one, you get to celebrate on your home field in game five. Well, that's not the way it worked out. Uh, The Nationals lost the next two games, so now it's 2-2, but okay, you got Scherzer and Strasburg next. Your two aces. You're going to win this World Series. And then three hours before Game 5, it's announced that, oh, yeah, Max Scherzer can't go tonight. His neck is stiff. In fact, it was so bad that his wife had to drive him to the ballpark. He couldn't even drive his own car. There was no way he was going to pitch. All right, let's throw Joe Ross out there. And Joe Ross tried. They lost the game. Come back. Now it's uh, it's it's now it's time for uh, to see what can happen with uh, with Steven Strasburg, and Strasburg wins the game. He pitches into the ninth inning. Sean Doolittle closes it out. Oh, actually, this is in Houston, so it's 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 this the last two games are in Houston. Uh, so they he wins that game. And they win that game seven to two. So now, unbelievably, Max Scherzer, who couldn't even turn his head just a few days earlier for game five, goes out on the mound to gut out what he can. And they fall behind. Home run by Yuli Gurriel in the bottom of the second inning gives the Astros a one nothing lead. Then Carlos Correa hit a two-out RBI single in the bottom of the fifth. Now it's 2-0. Uh, Scherzer then pitched five innings, allowing two runs on seven hits, striking out three. That's as far as he could go. Uh, Zach Greinke... He pitched, uh, he pitched and started for them and, and was pitching well, but they decided to, uh, to pull him out uh, before he'd given up one, only one hit, a single before Anthony Rendon's home run in the top of the seventh cut the Astros' lead to 2-1. to one. Greinke walked Juan Soto after Rendon's homer, then was replaced by Will Harris. Harris gave up a two-run homer to Howie Kendrick off the right field foul pole, giving the Nationals a 3-2 to two lead, which they never give, gave up. That is considered to be the greatest moment in Nationals history with Howie Kendrick hitting the home run off the foul pole. And uh, Harris later came and pitched here, which was, which was really cool. Anyway, uh, Nats were able to extend their lead 6-2 to two in the ninth, two-run scoring on a one-out single with, uh, with Adam Eaton with the bases loaded. Patrick Corbin comes in, pitches three innings of scoreless relief. He was tremendous in this series as both a starter and a reliever. Then Daniel Hudson coming in to pitch the bottom of the ninth. Michael Brantley is at the plate. Charlie Slows at the microphone for the Nationals. As the Nationals are a strike away from franchise history and some World Series history. As Hudson tries to close it out. It'll be another 3-2 pitch to Michael Brantley. Hudson sets. 
The kick in. Here it comes. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. And a World Series Game 7 winning Curly W is in the books. The celebration is on. The Washington Nationals are the world champions. Remember where you are. So you remember where you are right now at 11.50 Eastern Time. Remember where you are on October 30th, 2019, when the Washington Nationals finish the fight from the depths of a forgettable 19-31 start. They have climbed to the top of baseball's highest peak, giving us all a finish to a season we will remember for the rest of our lives. The Nationals celebrate just behind the pitcher's mound. A world championship, Curly W is in the books. The Nationals down to nothing, six unanswered runs. They beat the Astros six to two. They are the world champions of baseball. Unbelievable. Yeah, that was Charlie Slows four years ago tonight. Technically a great call in that he gave the historical time and place of it, which, you know, as you look back now, that's that's going to be important in years to come when people look back on the game and play the highlights. We're now in an era where we have all these things available thanks to YouTube. And this was a Vin Scully move. Vin Scully would give you the time when it happened, the city where it happened, you know, 931 in the city of the Angels, Los Angeles, California. So very well done by Charlie on this night four years ago as the Nationals in what was the 40th time a World Series had reached Game 7 and the first time that the championship team won all four games on the road. They close it out with a 6-2 to two victory. Trophy presentation down on the field. Mike Rizzo and Davey Martinez to accept. They're running the gamut right now. Um, for, uh, for our 94-year-old owner, for my 90-year-old dad, special assistant at the GM, to all the scouts and player development people out there, and to the players who make it all happen, we're the world champs tonight! Hey, Dave, come on in here. This team never dies, does it? Never, never, hey. They're a bunch of relentless, resilient bunch of guys, man. They love to play the game. They play the game every day. Today we were down, but they never thought they were out. That's a testament to these guys. I mean, they, they fought all year long, and uh, guess what? We stayed in the fight. We won the fight! Mm. What happened after that is is absolutely remarkable. All the things that toppled one after another after that championship. It was the first championship for Washington baseball in 95 years, not since the 1924 Washington Senators had we had a World Series champion in Washington. After the series was over, it seemed like a no-brainer to give Steven Strasburg that seven-year, $245 million extension. He was the MVP of the World Series. Who could ask for anything more? And at, what, 29, 30, uh, it seemed like the right thing to do. Uh, Strasburg has won one game since. His career is clearly over, and the only thing left is the official retirement. Uh, 2020 rolls around. You, you think, okay, you know, most of the guys are coming back. Rendon is gone, um, but you still have the, the, the makings of that team and, and Ryan Zimmerman to hold it together. Uh, nope, pandemic hits. They don't even get the season started on time. It's a 60-game schedule. Uh, Zimmerman sits out the year. Disappointing year. Okay, okay, pandemic. Regroup. Uh, Zimmerman comes back. Last place. Last place. Last place. Now, I'm encouraged with what is happening now with the team, and I, I do trust in Mike Rizzo. I think he's an excellent general manager. But just to think – where we've been in the last four years with this team and where we were four years ago tonight, it really is, is remarkable. And it's just a shame that we as fans didn't get to luxuriate, let's say, in winning the championship. What, what a normal 2020 would have been like without the pandemic. How great it would have been opening day to see the championship banner raised to to enjoy all the all the things that go along with being defending world champions sure you know things with Strasburg were going to unfold the way they were but Max was still an effective pitcher 
Um, you still had Trey Turner on the team. Juan Soto was was tremendous. And, and here we are four years later and just about everybody is gone. And what is left are memories of a magical night followed by what has really been a, a nightmare ever since. Now, it's, it looks like it's going to get better and it's going to trend in the right direction. And maybe two years from now, this will be a team that you can look at and say, you know, all the right moves were made by Mike Rizzo. And with some money, maybe they sign a, a free agent or two and they're back in the mix. But uh, what happened on this night four years ago will uh, will be hard to match. And it was uh, just a wonderful night and a wonderful few days that followed. Uh, one of the great things I've ever done in broadcasting was doing the parade from above the National Gallery of Art on a beautiful Saturday afternoon in Washington, D.C. Um, and those things are, are great memories, but uh, they seem like a lot longer ago than four years. Uh, a couple of things from the obits. I always tell you the most interesting reading is in the obit page. Bertie Bowman has passed away. He was 92 years old, and you may not know the name. In fact, you probably don't know the name. But uh, he is one of the people that helped to make government go. And it's, it's just an incredible American story. He was Bill Clinton's mentor when Clinton was a congressional clerk. He was friends with Strom Thurmond and Jesse Helms, both of them segregationists. And he worked until he was 90, coordinating sensitive hearings for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, the, the way that he got to Washington, it's just a, a testament to the human spirit. He grew up with 12 kids, 12 siblings, uh, without indoor plumbing, and the kids plowed the field barefoot, wore shoes only in winter. And to, to get out of the Deep South as a black man in that period of time in the 40s was absolutely amazing. In 1944, an opportunity presented itself at the local store where young Bertie arrived with two chickens stuffed in his pants legs for groceries. Senator Burnett Maybank was there campaigning for re-election. And he said to the crowd, if you ever get up to Washington, D.C., drop by to see me. This is a 13-year-old kid, 13-year-old kid who's got nothing. He's wearing shoes only in the winter. He approached the candidate the senator, in his limousine, in his chauffeured limousine, he said, if I come to Washington, can I come by and see you? And he said, certainly, my boy. Well, Bertie packed up his clothes in an empty flower sack, sneaked off to board a train for Washington, and after arriving at Union Station, he headed for Maybank's office. He found Maybank there. The senator hired him to sweep the Capitol steps, paying him out of his own pocket. Bertie slept on benches at night until he was able to afford his own accommodations. After five years, five years of sweeping the steps, he got a job in the coffee shop at the Capitol. One position led to another, and Bowman landed a clerical post with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1966, and the rest is history. Uh, just, just an unbelievable Rags to riches story uh, to be born in Summerston, South Carolina in 1931, one of 13 kids and to have made it to Congress, to the Senate, uh, to have a position like that is amazing. And uh, one quick thing on uh, Matthew Perry passing away, drowning over the weekend uh, in his obit. Um, he apparently, as, as you know, struggled with the fame, had, had drug problems and, and, and other things. But um it also says here in the obit, he confessed, he confessed in his memoir he found no stability in Hollywood success, only the agony of doubt. He found himself unable to sustain romantic relationships, which he primarily had with actresses. One source of security, however, was his fascination with Batman, and he became an obsessive collector of Batman memorabilia, even paying $20 million for an apartment he wound up hating because he thought it seemed like the kind of place that Batman's alter ego, Bruce Wayne, would live in. In a Washington Post interview, Perry referred to himself as a wealthy loner, fond of expensive black cars, kind of like Bruce Wayne. He jokingly called one of his assistants Alfred after the trusty manservant of the Batman strip. And that assistant, in turn, called Mr. Perry Mr. Wayne. Sad, sad. But, uh, boy, was he funny on Friends. And, um, yeah, they, they, they rerun all the time so you can see his work. But... A real tragedy, uh, dying at such a young age, 54 years old. Tony's coming up next. I'll see you back here tomorrow morning, 9 a.m.